I'm Scott Lachlan. This is the Data Chronicles, and here are your data points for today's episode. India has passed a new privacy and data security law called the Digital Data Protection Bill of 2023. That bill is going to have significant obligations and significant ramifications for global compliance programs on all things data privacy. While some may think that it looks like the GDPR is actually quite distinct from it. And so we're on this episode going to dive deeply into what it means for companies operating in India today and how they can start to position themselves for compliance with the new India data protection law. I'm so happy to be joined by one of my colleagues, Stephen Mathias. Stephen is one of our trusted go-to counsel in India. He is at the law firm of Kocher, senior partner and co-chair of the technology practice there. Stephen, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Scott. So, Stephen, maybe you can just start giving us an update about where we are in the legislative process. I understand it; it's past the legislature waiting the executive signature, but that is something of a formality. Sure. So the draft law was introduced in both houses of parliament last week and was cleared, was approved by both houses as well. It also received the assent of the president of India last Friday. So it's a done deal. It's, it's a law that's passed. But there is one last process, which is the government has to notify when it will come into force. What that means is that we do have a finalized law now. There's no going back on this. It's just a question of when they implement it. The minister announced that he expects it would take about six to 10 months to implement. Typically, they will notify different parts of the law at different times. So they would start, for instance, the Data Protection Board of India. They would typically notify that first so they can set it up and you know appoint the people to that board and then they have to start working on preparing notifications and so on so the indication is it will be in force within 10 months okay so if i got that right we have a finalized piece of legislation we know it's going to become effective and right around 10 months after this notice process is when we think that will actually come into force as per what the minister said yes okay And so, Stephen, you and I have had many conversations about how the developments in India in in the past, and I'm interested, maybe if you can give our audience some background and context about how this bill came to fruition, because I believe that there's been several past attempts at a comprehensive data protection law in India. That's right. It's been five years in the making, actually. So it started in 2017 when the Supreme Court of India was holding hearings on the issue of whether privacy constitutes a fundamental right under the Constitution of India. And during those hearings, the government made a submission to the court that they would appoint a committee to prepare a draft privacy law, which they did. They went ahead, appointed a committee. The committee prepared a white paper first, and then they came out with their first draft in 2018 that was put up for public comment. Then there was a second draft in 2019. And then it was sent to a joint committee of parliament for a review. And during 2021, more or less nothing happened. You know, that was the time of the pandemic. At the end of 21, the joint committee issued its report and it called for numerous changes, mostly to make the law stricter and tougher. And they had draft amendments in place. So I I call that the third draft. And then there was a rethink in 2022. The government got some feedback that the law was too prescriptive and too tough for Indian industry. And so they moved back on that and they looked towards drafting a simpler law. And that draft came out towards the end of 2022. They called again for comments. And then during this year, they've been reviewing that and making changes. This version, the what I call the fifth draft, is based on the 2022 version. It's a simpler version, but it's a bit more detailed than that one. And it corrects some of the problems with with that draft. So yeah, five years, five drafts, and we're finally there. (laughs) Well, it's a big development. So I'm glad that the government has taken time to try to get it right. Before we kind of launch into what the new law looks like, Stephen, maybe you can just give us a perspective on what 
existing privacy laws have been like within India, because this is not like this is an area where India did not have any type of data protection laws. This is going to be an area where either those existing laws will be replaced or supplemented by this new law. Sure. So leaving aside uh, sectoral regulations in areas like banking, insurance, telecom, and so on, the general law was really just two provisions, one which provided for payment of compensation in case one were negligent in using reasonable security practices and procedures while dealing with sensitive personal data, not all personal data. And there needed to be a wrongful gain or a wrongful loss that occurred. And only in that situation was there a payment of compensation. The law was a little difficult to understand. The government brought out rules as to what reasonable security practices and procedures were. But essentially, this was a law that only provided for payment of compensation. And essentially, if there were no breach, then there was no need to pay any compensation. The other provision was a criminal one which really provided for punishment in case one uh, disclosed personal information without consent or violation of agreement. But there again, with the intention of knowing that it's likely to result in wrongful gain or wrongful loss. And that really refers to mostly dishonest and fraudulent conduct. So that was uh, really all about data theft, really. And those were the only two provisions that existed in general privacy law in India. And then, as you mentioned, that you have the sector-specific laws that would be over and on top of that. Yes. So in the sector-specific laws, some of them, like the banking ones, prescribed security standards. And other than that, there are uh, data localization provisions. So you find that in telecom, for instance. The one which is most controversial is the one in payments, that all payment data by payment uh, service providers needs to be stored in India. And that came into force about a couple of years ago. And I think that causes the most pain point uh, within Indian industry from a data localization standpoint. And does the new law replace all of those existing laws? Are those existing laws going to continue or is that still to be decided? So the new law will replace one of those two provisions in the general law. That is the one on payment of compensation. It's uh, Section 43A of the Information Technology Act that provision will go away. The sectoral provisions will not go away. In fact, there's a provision that's been added in this final draft, which says that data localization requirements under sectoral regulation will continue. Okay, got it. So then, Stephen, let's just dive into the new law itself. I mean, one of the areas that when you and I have been talking about this in the past You have mentioned that some of the prior iterations of the bill have looked more like the GDPR and and the extension of the GDPR into India. But as I understand how this took its final form, it actually departs quite significantly from the GDPR. Maybe you can comment on how you see GDPR and the differences between that and the new India law. Sure. So the first two drafts, uh, 2018 and the 2019, and the next one, the first three drafts, really, those were all based on GDPR. Some people actually felt it was stricter than GDPR. There was someone I know who called it GDPR++. So the concept of legitimate interest, for instance, was missing. There were significant data localization provisions as well. The third one, which was recommended by the Joint Parliamentary Committee, had even more stringent provisions in there. And thereafter, the 2022 draft, which this one is based on, is a much simpler one. Some of the rights that you see in GDPR, like accountability, privacy by design, data portability, and so on, those are largely missing from this law. But at the same time, there are actually some provisions here which are stricter than GDPR. So there's no general legitimate interest type of ground under this law. And consent is by and large the most likely route that most companies will have to take. The provisions on consent about it being, you know, free consent and so on are are pretty much exactly the same as what's written in GDPR. I think businesses who go through legitimate interest in the EU may not be able to do that in India, will have to go through consent in India. And then you have other provisions which are stricter. For example, 
data breach, there's a notification required in every case to the authority and also to the relevant data subject. Interesting. So maybe, Stephen, one question that I'm sure will be on top of minds, especially for U.S.-based organizations, is when does this new law apply? In what context, especially for companies who may have operations in India, but be processing a large amount of non-India resident data inside of their jurisdiction? Does the law specify how the law applies and in what context it applies? So there are two interesting situations here. One is where you have a business outside India that's processing personal data of people in India. So what the law says there is that if you're offering services or goods to persons in India, then you're covered by the law. I mean, the word offering is something that's up for interpretation. If you're an online business outside India and you accept customers from everywhere, are you offering a service in India? So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is where You have an Indian business that's located in India, processing in India, but processing personal information of non-Indians. So what happens there? So by and large, this law exempts that situation. There are some provisions that do apply. For example, using reasonable security standards to safeguard the personal information, that would still apply. But by and large, the provisions don't apply. So in that sense, if you're getting data from, say, the EU and processing it in India, then GDPR would apply. Indian law would largely not apply. It's somewhat of a contradiction in the sense that one of the reasons one felt one needed data privacy law in India is to assure the world that, you know, as we process more of the world's data than any other country, we have a sound, robust law here as well. But that won't quite be the case because most of this law doesn't apply to foreign data being processed in India. Hmm. I think the implications for that are, I think, are probably quite significant. So if I heard you correctly, it sounds like there are some provisions that would apply to non-India data, including some of the data security provisions, but all of the core privacy-oriented provisions, data protection provisions relating to the basis for processing and the consent requirements, individual rights, all of those things would only apply to India data subjects. Is that fair? That's right. Interesting. Now, you said something earlier around the basis for processing and that unlike the GDPR and the various ways that you can establish a lawful basis, including through legitimate interest, are not applicable under the new India data protection law. Instead, it sounds like you would primarily need to rely on consent. Maybe you can speak a little bit more about what that looks like. Obviously, consent sometimes is easier to get than other times. I think it's somewhat of a mixed bag in the sense you have consent, or you have what they call legitimate uses, and then you have exemptions. So, Consent is by and large the main ground on which you would process personal information. But there are a bunch of exemptions. And for example, employment is one exemption, very unusually. Most of the law doesn't apply when you're processing personal information for employment. There are other provisions which are like compliance with law, court orders, things like that, which are kind of obvious. But a legitimate interest ground as it is understood in the EU, is largely not mentioned in this law. Interesting. How about, is there a business-to-business exception here? So in other words, as like business contact information, would that be covered by this law or is that also not applicable? So this law deals with personal information, information of individuals only. So like, for example, Stephen, in, in my Rolodex, or in my contact list, you know, your name appears. Is that is your name covered by this law? And do I have obligations with respect to that data now? Or is this something that would be not uh, applicable? Yes, it would be covered. Interesting. Okay. So if I think then consent being the primary basis for processing information, sometimes consent can't be had. And when I read your summary of it, there is actually a provision in place that talks about an individual not objecting to the processing of their information and that being constitute consent or that being an exemption to the consent process. 
that's a little unusual, I think, in the ways that other types of data protection statutes are set up. Interested in understanding what your view is of that provision? Yeah, I think it's a very ambiguous provision. I think it's badly drafted. I think to some extent, it probably relates to a situation where the data subject has given the personal information on his or her own initiative. It also could relate somewhat to contractual necessity. So one of the list illustrations is where an individual visits a pharmacy to buy some medicines and then hands over personal information in the course of that transaction. So that is an example of this. I don't think it's well worded. I do think it could be seen as somewhat of a loophole in the sense that giving something voluntarily, you could give a large number of specified purposes and ask the data subject to provide the personal information and they provide it, they're giving it voluntarily. So I'm sure it'll be up for interpretation as to what exactly it means. I would caution clients on using this indiscriminately. Got it. Yeah, it sounds like more to be known, right? And maybe more analysis and the more kind of practice data needs to be assembled to understand exactly how that provision is going to play out in practice. That's right. Stephen, you mentioned that there are also departures in the way that the new law would, would apply for things like individual rights and data subject rights and notices. Maybe you can give a quick overview about what type of transparency obligations appear under the new law and what rights individuals have under the new statute. Sure. So the rights, uh, the basic rights that you see in most uh, data privacy legislations are there. The right to access to find out what personal information is being processed, the right to uh, correction where the personal information is incorrect, the right to updating it where it needs to be updated, and also the right to have it deleted where the purpose for which the personal information was collected has been served. There is also the right of grievance. So data subject can write to the relevant data fiduciary and, you know, mention what their complaint is and have that needs to be dealt with through a proper process. That's essentially what the rights are here. So something like a right to data portability is not covered in the new law. But importantly, those rights would not be applicable in connection with the employment context, right? That's what it looks like because it applies in situation where you've obtained personal information through consent or through that voluntary provision. Those are the situations where it would apply. If it comes under the exemptions, then it does not apply. So if the employment and the employment context, we don't need to obtain a new consent in order to process employee data. Thus, it's not something that's going to also trigger these new individual rights obligations. That's right. Got it. Stephen, as you know, one of the pain points that many clients have is around engaging vendors, engaging processors to be able to process information. Sometimes those processors are in India. Some of them are kind of can be in any number of jurisdictions worldwide. And as new laws come on board, oftentimes they impose new and specific sets of contractual requirements that need to be included, which means that you end up having to consistently and continuously update agreements. Interested in your perspective, are there new data processing oriented terms that need to be included? And how does this law apply to data processors? So the law does not say very much about data processors. It requires the data, what we call the data fiduciary or the data controller to have a contract with the data processor. And it does make the data fiduciary responsible for any violations by the data processor. So practically, one would need to look at all those data transfer agreements and ensure that whatever are the obligations of the data fiduciary under this law, those are placed upon the data processor as well. At the same time, the provision on penalties, it doesn't say specifically that it's going to hold just the data fiduciary liable. So it's possible the data processor could also be held held liable. It's certainly a tricky situation for the data fiduciary or data controller. So it sounds like there's still more work to be done then. If a data fiduciary, which I think is loosely 
a data controller in other jurisdictions, as I understand it. So the data fiduciary, the data controller, they have an obligation to flow down you know, their responsibilities to a processor so that the processor would also need to adhere to those same obligations. But the law is not specific or prescriptive about what terms exactly need to be included in order for the data fiduciary to do that. Is that a fair summary? Yes. In fact, I think the law is also not very clear whether the data processor can be held liable directly. There are some indications that the law will essentially hold the data fiduciary liable. So that's an aspect that's somewhat unclear. Okay. And that would be an example you know, we're talking about a scenario where an individual company in India is processing data relating to Indian consumers, not employees, but Indian consumers. And then they engage a subprocessor to process that information. And then the key question is, can that processor be held liable for any unlawful processing under that relationship? Right. The answer is not very clear. Of course, through contract, they could be held liable, but whether they can be held liable directly, that's not very clear. And is it also the case that even if it were a processor outside of India, right? So let's say you a, a, the India-based organization engages a processor in the United States, could the U.S. organization processing that information be held liable? Also, again, not clear. Not clear in the sense that it's not clear how the data processor would be held liable directly by the data protection board. But it is clear in the sense of from the cross-border point of view. So the fact that they are in the US would not be relevant at all. So essentially, the law is going to apply outside of India to the extent that you have a data fiduciary processing India data, even if they're not located in India. That's right. Are there provisions in place? you know, similar to what the GDPR would require in other jurisdictions that would impose limitations on transferring India data outside of India's boundaries or borders? What the law provides is a power of the government to blacklist particular countries. So you can send Indian personal data to any country unless it's a country that has been added to the negative list of the government. That's all that it says. And it does, as I mentioned earlier, does say that if there are sectoral regulations on data localization, those would continue to be in force. And is there any description or process about how a country would be blacklisted? Actually, no. There is no adequacy test that's been included in the statute. So it's just up to the government to determine that. Then by that means, I assume it's not also not clear as to whether blacklisted countries would be those countries that don't have, quote unquote, adequate data protection laws, or maybe countries for which you know there is some open hostilities or some other political component that would mean that the government would use these types of laws to prevent the data from moving to that country. It sounds like, are both of those in play, or do you anticipate one or the other to be more applicable? I anticipate both of them will be in play. With regard to the second one on political hostility, there has been for some while concern over Chinese companies doing business in India and storing personal data of Indians in China. It's very likely that China would make that negative list. And I think the bigger concern in terms of big international centers that may house personal data would be Hong Kong. And what's driving Hong Kong is just part of the affiliation with China? That's right. A few other questions on the law itself. So you mentioned that data security provisions were also part of this. Interested in one, how prescriptive those data security provisions look like. And then two, suppose that companies who are processing covered data have a security incident Are there new notification requirements that would apply in the event of one of those incidents? So the obligation is not very prescriptive. It's just to provide reasonable security safeguards. If there's a breach, and unfortunately, the definition of data breach is quite wide and seems to cover vulnerabilities as well. In that situation, you have to notify both the data protection board 
and the relevant data subject. And there is no threshold like, you know, risk or harm and so on. You just have to do it and you do it in, in every case. So that's, again, an example where the law is stricter than GDPR. And so there is an existing data breach notification obligation under the, I think, the certain process, if I remember correctly, which I think had a sixth hour timeline for notification. Is that still going to be in place or does this new law impact that requirement? So this law does not impact that requirement, but whether businesses go back to the government and say, this is a bit unreasonable for us to notify two different government authorities and you need to streamline this process, then I think that's a very fair feedback to give to the government and perhaps the government will consider it. But as of now, the way the new law is written, it doesn't impact that at all. So there is a possibility you could be having to notify the Data Protection Board, having to notify CERT, and also notify data subjects. And so remind me of the timelines for notification to the Data Protection Board, the data subjects under the new law? There is no timeline, so it will probably come through delegated legislation. Okay. So in other words, more kind of specifics that would need to be play out to focus in on what the requirements are for notice, what the contents of the notice looks like, and then what the timelines for notice would be. That's right. Interesting. I think one of the other things, Stephen, you mentioned in one of the write-ups that I saw that you authored, which was around the concept of a significant data fiduciary. That's an unusual concept, at least in my experience, What is a significant data fiduciary and what are the additional obligations that those types of organizations have? So a a significant data fiduciary could be a fiduciary that meets either of two standards. One is a data fiduciary that processes a large amount of data. So that would be volume-based. And the second one is quite unusual where it refers to provisions like threat to democracy, and so on. So I guess that relates more to organizations like news media and so on. So it is possible that a small news media organization might be covered as a significant data fiduciary, even though it may process not very high volumes of data. What are their obligations? How is it different? One, they have to appoint a data protection officer, but the DPO, basically his job is to manage grievances, and other data fiduciaries also have to appoint someone to do that. So there's not that much difference there. There's a requirement to do a data audit through an independent auditor, and there's a requirement to do a privacy impact assessment. The details of that are not very clear of what exactly needs to be covered and so on. So those are essentially what are the obligations of a significant data fiduciary. And do you have a sense, Stephen, of how many significant data fiduciaries there are? Right? In other words, is this something that's going to be only a handful? Or do we think that a lot of our clients and organizations are going to constitute significant data fiduciaries? Well, in a different law relating to intermediaries, there's a significant social media intermediary. And there, there is a number in terms of number of subscribers. So I suspect they would first bring in the the number of data principles or data subjects whose personal data is being processed. That's the first one. I would think it would be a small number of data fiduciaries. I don't think it would be a very large number. The second one I suspect would be anyone involved in content and particularly news content. That may involve more organizations. And I think you had also made the point when we spoke last that this law has some non-privacy elements to it, in particular around content blocking, now seeing a trend and continuously you know, thought of as issues that are coming up in a number of jurisdictions around content. How does the new India law apply to content in particular? There is a content blocking provision that's been added here. It was somewhat of a surprise. The reason being that there is already content blocking powers available to the government under the Information Technology Act, but the grounds there are different and relate to grounds typically covered in the Constitution when it comes to restrictions on free speech and so on. 
I think this one is about a situation where someone is violating privacy laws and the data protection board refers the matter to the government. Perhaps they're not able to enforce. And in that situation, the government would then pass an order to this effect. So it's quite an unusual provision. But as I mentioned, content blocking is a power available with the government already under a different statute. Any reason why you think that they were looking to reinforce that protection if it already existed elsewhere? I mean, something unusual that's happening with respect to the passage of this law that would have driven the inclusion of this particular power in a, in a personal data protection law? I mean, I think uh, public policy in India at the moment is probably a little more restrictive when it comes to regulating content. And that may be a reason for driving this. Okay. So we're going to save maybe the last couple of questions, and maybe they're the most important for many of the, our listeners, Stephen, is now we have a law that's going to place, you said earlier, around 10 months. So as a result, and we know what that law is going to look like, you know, how are you in these early days trying to help clients prepare for what they need to do, in particular, as they look for updating their already global compliance programs that they have structured to meet obligations under the GDPR or under U.S. laws or kind of any of the other laws that are going to apply to their organizations? How are you approaching this new development? So I think at the first stage, it's just to make everyone aware that we finally have this law. I think last week when it got introduced in Parliament and went through the upper house, there was almost surprise that, are you actually going to pass this this time or just one more draft? So I think people have to wake up and realize that this law is actually there. It's actually finalized. It will come into force sooner or later. The second thing is, I think there has to be change of mindset because the kind of mindset that you have, I would say definitely in the EU and possibly globally, that you have to treat personal information with care. And you've got to be very careful about how you collect it, how you process it, where you store it, and how you just keep track of it. Because someone can come to you and say, what personal information of mine do you have? Delete it. And I think that change of mindset is something that's really important for Indian industry to embrace. We are obviously doing trainings, we're doing calls with our clients. And once they get the basic information on how the law applies to them, then you move on to looking at your privacy policy and how does that apply to India with the new law and what needs to be changed. And then from there, you go into actually how do you process data differently based on the law? Can you process it the same way or do you need to make changes there too? I think one of the things that I'm sure you have experienced too is that many clients are looking to establish rules and compliance programs that are designed to cover many jurisdictions' laws by looking at those areas of overlap and looking at those areas of synergy. And then perhaps when there is a not direct lineup between one law and another, then adding something more specific what I understood from this conversation is that many organizations may end up using GDPR as their baseline set of data processing principles that are going to be the core components of their overall compliance program, but that may not take you all the way to compliance under this new law. Instead, there is going to have to be additional attention given to things like consent and things like the specific obligations relating to individual rights and transparency that are going to be different and unique from the way the GDPR operates. That's right. I think that most clients are very particular about not making changes to their standard privacy policy for a particular country unless it's absolutely required. My sense is that a GDPR-compliant privacy policy will comply with most of this law but the big one is the ground for processing, where a lot of clients are using legitimate interest. They won't be able to use that here. In some cases, they may be lucky to be covered by one of the exemptions or the legitimate use. But in most cases, they'll need to obtain consent. And I think that's one of the, the biggest differences. And so do we anticipate, given that there are so many laws that are coming on board, 
I think one challenge is trying to try to stay on top of all of the updates that compliance programs are going to need to have. So this law is intended to go into effect or anticipated to go into effect in around 10 months. Does that mean that everything needs to be done within that 10-month period, or will there be a grace period for organizations to bring themselves into compliance once the statute is actually finalized? So India doesn't have a history of a grace period where the law comes into force, but it says that you need to comply only within X months. What India normally does is it brings in different parts of the law at different times into force. So I'm hoping that what they'll do here is they'll notify when the law will come into force immediately, but they'll give a date in the future. So then everybody knows that's the date where by which time you need to comply. So effectively from the date that they notify till that date, that's your grace period. I think it's probably going to just be the 10 months. 10 months, that's kind of where we think the minimum amount is a chance that they could extend it further. But 10 months looks like that's the time period where we have to bring our compliance programs up to speed with this new law. Yes, based on a couple of things. One are the comments made by the minister. And two is based on the history of how India typically brings legislation into force. Got it. Okay. Last question for you, Stephen, is I assume there's penalty provisions. What does the penalties and enforcement look like under this new regime? Sure. So there's a schedule with a bunch of penalties. It goes up to about 30 million US dollars and it covers different things and it's not very prescriptive. So it's really up to the data protection board to look at what is the extent of the non-compliance and what is the impact of it and then determine a penalty. And the data protection board would be the primary enforcement entity? Yes, that's right. And do individuals, individual data subjects, do they have the right to bring lawsuits, which are increasingly common here in the United States, or is this something that would only be enforced by the Data Protection Authority? So that's interesting. The individuals can complain to the Data Protection Board. The Data Protection Board has the power to impose penalties. It has no power to award damages or compensation, and the civil courts have no powers either. So What that means is an individual has no right to receive compensation under this law. Well, Stephen, really appreciate your time and your patience in walking through all of the new requirements and what this law means. I imagine that we'll have a lot of new questions and a lot of areas that we'll have an opportunity to dig further in into the future. But this initial walkthrough and overview of the new law is actually really helpful for for me and I'm sure many of the members of our audience. So thank you so much for joining the podcast. Thanks for having me and uh, look forward to more debate on how this law plays out in the future. With that, I'm Scott Lachlan. This is the Data Chronicles and those are your data points. Data Chronicles.